want us to get in agreement. Yeah. But uh, I want to say something about that first. Because you hear people do this all the time. Someone will come along and say, well, get in, get in agreement with me about this. And that sounds really good. But if you actually look at the scriptures where it talks about agreement, it talks about people agreeing in prayer. Yeah. In other words, not just saying, well, you know, just, just agree with me. No, if we're going to agree on something, then let's actually agree in prayer on it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And so, that's what I want to do. To, I want us to get in agreement about something, but we're going to agree in prayer. Amen. Is that right? Yes, it is. All right. So you just get in agreement with me. <laughs> and let's pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you for this day. Yes, we do. I thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together in your name. Yes, Lord. I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for your precious Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that you would minister unto us this day. Give us understanding concerning your Word. Bring revelation to us. Move how you desire to move, Lord. We give you free course in this place. I choose to open my mind and my heart to receive what you have for me this day. And so we look to you. We set aside all the cares of this world and we look only unto you and we fully expect to receive what you have for us this day. And we thank you for that. We believe it's ours. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Huh. You, come here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just during the time of worship, the Lord just began to minister my heart concerning you. Desires that you have in your heart. Those desires, he'll bring them to pass. You just roll your care over onto him. You just trust him. See, there's hope there. There's desire there. But put your faith out there. Because faith becomes the substance of the things that we hope for, the things that we desire. Faith makes those things happen. But they will happen. They'll come to pass. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for all that you put within her heart. And all that you desire to do in her life, Lord, I declare that it shall come to pass. In the name of Jesus, she'll walk in all that you've got for her. And I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus. And even this day, Lord, as you chose to minister unto her this way, may this day be a day that she'll look back on and say, things have turned around. Things are moving forward. I recognize this increase. I recognize this change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now thank you. For stirring those things. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Rabbi Soko. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. Glory to God. I always appreciate the worship here at your church. Worship is important. And because uh, worship is that time, not only when we lift up the Lord and magnify him, obviously we're doing that, but worship is also a time in, w in which we can set aside the cares of this life. We can set aside the things that we've been yeah. dealing with and we just draw near unto him. Amen. And we can free our hearts of worry, anxiety, fretting. We and we can just get into his presence and relax. <laughs> and that becomes important. It's important for us to do that. And so having worship leaders, worship teams that know how to help people come into that place becomes valuable and I want to commend this church for doing that I do because not all are that way <laughs> but I commend the church here for that hallelujah because when we can come into that place and we we, we become free then God's able to begin to move in our lives and do things that he's been wanting to do all along, but there's been just things that kind of prevent us from opening up to him. And we can be so caught up in just the busyness of life. But it's important. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I have in my heart to, today to share with you what I call, and it, it, I have to explain a little bit, but what I call giving and receiving. Now, when we think of giving and receiving, automatically we just seem to think about finances. Well, I give finances and we've been taught that that well we we should sow and then in turn I mean because we sow then there's a harvest that comes and so we receive and so we often think of it in that respect when you mention even those terms giving and receiving then it seems like right away people think well finances but that's not how we're going to look at it today <laughs> in fact I probably hardly mentioned finances at all Our lives need to be lives that involve giving and receiving. Amen. Now, the reason it's that way is because we are in relationship. We're in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. We have communion with him. We enjoy that, the companionship, the love from our Heavenly Father. We're in relationship with one another in the church. We're in relationship in our, our homes, family, marriages. We're involved in relationship. And in relationship, there is giving and there is receiving. And so I, I want to read a, a scripture to you, and I'm not, I'm not going to teach on marriage at all. <laughs> we were here not too long ago <laughs> and uh, had a marriage seminar and uh, I probably read this verse. I would assume I did. But I want to read this. And this is over in Ephesians chapter 5. Now often when we read these again we think about marriage, husband and a wife but the Apostle Paul he makes it clear and we'll see it as we read this. He makes it clear that he was actually talking about Christ in the church. But he's talking about relationship. Yep. 
So let me read it to you. This is Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to begin in verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. And uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. All right, so interesting. I mean, and obviously there's things we could learn here about the relationship with husband and wives, but how many times just in those few verses that we read did he bring out Christ in the church? He says, for the husband's the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And then he goes on, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Again, so here's this mention of Christ in the church. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present to her, might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He loves his wife, loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So here it is again, Christ in the church. For we're members of his body, the church, <laughs> Jesus, of his flesh, his bones. Then he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he says now in verse 32, he says, this is a great mystery, talking about the marriage relationship. But he said, I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then he says, well, now, nevertheless, <laughs> in other words, even though I'm talking about Christ in the church, nevertheless, well, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. But he says he was speaking concerning Christ in the church. Now, that's interesting. And for those that had attended the marriage seminar that I did, one of the things that we really emphasized because it's so true is that the marriage relationship is a blood covenant relationship. Amen. It's not just an agreement that we enter into. It's not a formal contract that we enter into. It is actually a blood covenant relationship. That's right. Amen. And so Paul uses the marriage relationship being a blood covenant relationship to speak about the church. Well, now again, I mean, and I'm not going to get into all that this morning, but if we examine the scriptures, we can clearly see that the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus is a blood covenant relationship. Amen. 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 For those that were here earlier listening to some of the stuff that Brother Hagin was saying, you know, he, he had talked about the blessings of Abraham. Well, Abraham, God had made a blood covenant with him. It was a blood covenant relationship. And so, now we're, we're heirs of that same thing, but we're involved in a blood covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus. We're one with him. And that's really the essence of the blood covenant relationship is that the two now become one. Amen. And so that becomes true in a marriage relationship. The two become one. It's a blood covenant relationship. But it's also very obvious. It's true in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. He's in me. I'm in him. I'm seated together with him. The list goes on and on and on. We are in a blood covenant relationship with him. But now, in a blood covenant relationship, there is giving and there is receiving. In fact, in, when, you, when you're involved in a blood covenant relationship 
as we are with the Lord Jesus. Everything that I am, everything that I ever will be, all my assets, all my liabilities, anything I ever will have belongs to my covenant partner. Amen. And the scripture talks about those very things. It says, you're not your own. It says, you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, everything that you have in this present life, including your very life, is not yours. Belongs to him. Amen. Amen. He created it all. And he owns it all. Including you. <laughs> See, sometimes we think we're doing God such a big favor because we bring some, you know, financial gift and offer it to him. Well, you can't give anything that he don't already own. And you can read, there's a, there's a story that takes place under the old covenant with David and the temple and so forth. And, and he actually makes that statement. He tells the Lord, because they brought this great offering. He says, well, we couldn't bring anything but what, I, what I already belonged to you anyway. Now, that's my paraphrase version. But that's what he said. So it all belongs to him. See, people get, people get hung up even on tithing. You know, tithing has been such a sensitive subject for hundreds of years. <laughs> Thousands, really, in the church. And I'm thinking, you know what? You don't just, you don't just owe 10%. You owe everything. It's all his. It all belongs to him. All right. Damn. But see, in blood covenant, that's how it works. And so my very life belongs to him. And everything about it. I mean, the very air I breathe, it's his. His air. <laughs> Amen. Anything I could ever have in this earth, any possession I ever have, whatever, it's all his. And that's how it works in a blood covenant relationship. But then there's also the other side of that, is that now, because I'm in a blood covenant relationship with him, Everything that he is, everything that he ever will be, <laughs> everything that he has, now what does he have? Well, the Bible says he owns it all. Cattle on a thousand hills, it all belongs to him. His very life, because I'm in a blood covenant relationship with him. And so everything that he has, his very life, now belongs to me. Amen. Ah. Yeah. So now I have his life. I have his power. I have his love. Everything that he is now belongs to me as well. Now, some people have a really hard time grasping hold of that. But that's how it works in a blood covenant relationship. That's why it even makes a statement concerning Jesus that he ever lives to make intercession for you. His life is devoted to you. So, if we're going to live successfully in a blood covenant relationship, which is what we have with the Lord. Then there's giving and there's receiving. And in order for the relationship to be successful, you need both. So the question then becomes is, well, what are we supposed to give? Because there's a giving side to this blood covenant relationship. Well, we already can kind of get an indication of that because what we're supposed to give is everything. 
because it all belongs to him. Now, let me read a scripture to you. This is found over in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to begin with verse 24. And this is from the Amplified Classic Version. Matthew 16, starting in verse 24. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple. All right, so, if anyone desires to be a follower of him, we could say. We're going to be a disciple. We're going to be this disciplined follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone wants to do that, well, that's me. Put myself in that classification. Then here's what that person needs to do, isn't it? This is very interesting. He says, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself in his own interests. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty strong language. But see, that's blood covenant talk. He says, so if, you're gonna, if anyone desires to be my disciple, then, well, disregard, lose sight of, forget himself and his own interests, and take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying also. Amen. Yeah. In other words... It's a blood covenant relationship, and so now my very life belongs to my blood covenant partner. And so what am I to give in this kind of relationship? Everything. My very life. Even if it costs me, even if it costs my life. Because he says, isn't that what he says? He says, cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying also. Because that's how it works in blood covenant. For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security here, shall lose it, eternal life, and whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here for my sake, shall find it. Life everlasting. Yes. Now that's really the word zoe. It means the life as God has it. The only way you truly find and get to experience the real life of God, because it's a blood covenant relationship now, is that you give everything. My life is yours, Lord. And in doing so, I find life. Zoe, life as God has it. His blessings, who he is, everything that he has for me, see, because it now belongs to me in this blood covenant relationship. But if I don't honor the terms of the covenant, then I don't get to experience the blessings of the covenant. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Amen. Now, remember Paul had used the example of husband and a wife. Just to give us something to relate to, let's put that, this same thinking into that relationship because it's a blood covenant relationship. If I'm going to experience the best that marriage has to offer, then how am I going to approach that relationship? I'm going to be so committed to it that I'm going to disregard and lose sight and forget about myself and my own interests. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. And I'm going to be interested in my blood covenant partner. Yeah. Huh? That's where I'm going to find the life. If I don't choose to live my life that way, then there's blessings that, that could be there in that marriage that won't be there. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Keep preaching it. Now, if, 
if I'm bent, as it uses that terminology in the Amplified, if I'm bent, you could say, on saving my single life, <laughs> then I'm going to lose the life that I could have as a married person. Well, I want to be married, and I want all, you know, I want all the, you know, benefits of the marriage, but I'm not going to give 100%. Well, then we wonder why marriages fail all the time. All right. And that's the way it works with the Lord Jesus. You wonder why so many people are struggling in relationship with the Lord is because they haven't come to that place where they say, you know what? My life belongs to you. They're bent on saving Whatever kind of <laughs> lower life that they're trying to hang on to, that they think they should hang on to, they're trying to hang on to that, and they're missing the life that God has for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a blood covenant relationship. And so what do we give? Everything. Hallelujah. Let me give you another one. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Pick it up here in verse 37. Still reading from the Amplified. Matthew 10 verse 37. We've had some pretty strong words. It says, He who loves and takes more pleasure in father or mother than in me. Now Jesus was saying this. He who loves and takes more pleasure in father and mother than me is not even worthy of me. Wow. And he who loves and takes more pleasure in son or daughter more than in me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me cleaves steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living, and if need be, in dying also, is not worthy of me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Pretty strong words, but you know what those words are? They're blood covenant words. Because that's how it works in the blood covenant. And really, we again, we could go back to the marriage relationship. If I'm going to put other people, other things above my wife, then I'm not really worthy of her. Hallelujah. <laughs> it says, continuing on, he says, whoever finds his lower life will lose it, the higher life. And whoever loses his lower life on my account will find it, the higher life. Huh. Interesting. So we're in a blood covenant relationship. What do we give? Everything. It isn't where God just has small portions of our life. It isn't where God has just small portions of my money. It all belongs to him. Everything. Not just, I don't, he doesn't have just small portions of it because it's all his. He owns it all anyway. And I'm just a steward of it. Whatever I have, I'm just being a steward of what belongs to him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I remember hearing this. I wasn't there, but someone had reported it to me. That this was several, several years ago, quite a few years ago. And Brother Oral Roberts had assembled a, a, a number of ministers together and um, and he was sharing with these ministers just some things about ministry trying to help them things he did he had learned and experienced and things like this and people that went like said I wasn't there it was kind of 
in the very early days of my ministry, I didn't even know what was going on, and they didn't invite me. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, people reported things to me. And one of the things, among many things, wisdom that Brother Roberts was endeavoring to part to ministers, one of the things that Brother Roberts said was, he said his biggest concern when he finally would meet Jesus face to face, his biggest concern was whether he'd handled the money correctly. Now, I thought that's interesting. Because you could be concerned about a lot of things. <laughs> but he knew that it wasn't his money. That it belonged to God. And whether or not he'd done a good job with it. That's blood covenant. So everything belongs to him. Our very lives belong to him. What we should be doing is this, and this is found over in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, a familiar scripture, verse 33. And again, I'm still reading from the Amplified. It says this, but seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all. Because we're in a blood covenant relationship. First of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and then all these things taken together will be given to you besides. Now, he'd been talking about that we shouldn't be worried and anxious about what we're going to wear and what we're going to eat and what we're going to drink. He says those are the things the Gentiles seek after. In other words, those that don't know Jesus, they're going to crave after those things. They're going to seek after those things because that's all they know. But you now have entered into a blood covenant relationship. And so now in this blood covenant relationship, everything that he has now belongs to you. And he says, well, you don't have to be concerned about those things anymore. But what you should be doing, because you're in this relationship, you ought to be aiming at and striving after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness. His way of doing and being right. And then all these other things just taken together will be given unto you. Because it's blood covenant. Yep. But blood covenants are two-sided. A blood covenant is only as good as the two parties involved. Because both have to honor the terms of the covenant. If one chooses not to honor the terms of the covenant, then it doesn't work that good. Amen. Amen. That's why you can read about it, and, I, and again, I'm trying not to go back and look at all these details, but uh, you can read in Genesis when God cut that covenant with Abraham and of course it was an everlasting covenant so it would you know it would go on down to all his descendants and and of course now because we're in Christ and one with him now we're heirs to that same covenant and but when God cut that covenant see we often say well it was a covenant between God and Abraham well technically it wasn't because if you go and read the whole story of how it all happened is that God comes to Abraham and he says, well, I'm going to cut a covenant with you. Well, Abraham, he understood this because he understood blood covenant, what that meant. And so this whole thing takes place where he instructs Abraham to do certain things to prepare for, you know, cutting this covenant because there are certain practices that they had. And one of the things that they would do is that they would take, they'd take a, a, like a heifer, a cow, and they'd cut it in half. Now, they wouldn't cut it in half where, you know, the head's on one side and the, and the rear end's on the other. They'd cut it this way. And so you'd have two halves that would lay over like this. And then they would walk through 
the two parties cutting the covenant, among other things that they would do. But they would walk through those pieces in a figure eight. And what's a figure eight? Infinity, in other words, the blood covenant's forever. It's an everlasting covenant. And so they would do that, but when God cut that covenant with Abraham, it's very interesting. You can read the story back there in Genesis. It says that a deep sleep fell on Abraham. Well, now I believe that, I mean, the presence of God showed up. Abraham, he's just knocked out under the power of God. He's laying off the side. But there are two, there are two people that walk between those pieces. And it was Jesus and the Father. That's right. Amen. See, because the, the Father knew that a covenant's only as good as the two parties involved. And if he just made a covenant between him and Abraham, that wouldn't be a very good covenant because Abraham's not perfect. He can mess up the covenant. Yep. Now God wouldn't. See? Right. And so, but yet he had, he had to include man in this whole thing. Well, we know, I mean, we could talk about the whole story. I mean, eventually Jesus comes and all the things that happen. You know, so now we're in him and so now we're part of the covenant. There's, there's a lot of things that happen with all that. But see, he needed someone involved that would make the covenant everlasting that would make it so the covenant would be good. Amen. And so he made it between him and Jesus, his son. And so now the covenant's good. Because it's only as good as the two people involved. But now, see, when I receive Jesus, now I'm in Christ. So now I'm in him. And so now I'm heirs according to the covenant. Because I'm in him. Amen. And so. <laughs> yes. oh, yeah. The covenant works for me because I'm in him. Amen. But what I do need to do. Is I need to do exactly what Jesus said I needed to do. Is that I needed to be willing. <laughs> to deny myself. Lose sight of, forget myself, pick up his cross, follow him. In other words, what I need to do is be committed to following him. And if I'm committed to following him, I'm in this covenant. Because I'm holding up my, you could say, my end of the covenant. Now, I can miss it, whatever else, but I'm staying in him. And my whole purpose is, I'm going to do my part in this covenant. Which means, I am in him and I'm going to be committed to him. I'm going to follow him. Uh, my life belongs to him. Everything about me, everything I have, it all belongs to him. And so now this covenant is working in my life. Amen. And it will work in yours. Yeah. And so that's what he needs from us. He needs us to give that our very lives. Yeah. Now, he has all these other things. I, I kind of, you know, casually joke about this, but Really, we got the better end of the deal. Amen. Because God got us, but, you know, <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you didn't get much. <laughs> because, I mean, we recognize all, you know, all our mistakes we can make and failures and all. I mean, but... We really got the better end of the deal here because we got him. Yeah. And everything that he is and ever will be and all his possessions, everything else, now belongs to me, the covenant partner. Because I'm in Christ. Wow. So I'm not going to lose anything by giving my life to him. Because there's so much to gain. Yeah. 
So that's what we give. We give everything. Now, there's more we could add to this because it gets really interesting. And I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but not only are we one with the Lord Jesus, but we're also one with one another. And so we find many exhortations within the scriptures that talk about how really we owe love to one another. We're to love people, we're to help people, we're to bear their burdens. See, we're in this thing together. It's a blood covenant relationship. And so I'm going to avail myself all that I am. I'm going to avail myself to other people because I'm one with them too in the body of Christ. Just something to think about. I want to go over to Acts chapter 9. Here's a story about um, then known as Saul. Later we know him as Paul, Paul the Apostle. But then known as Saul, he's not saved. And uh, he actually was very involved in in persecuting, killing Christians, <laughs> those that were the followers of the Lord. But an interesting thing happens here in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up in verse 3. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Now, this is Paul, well, Saul at the time. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round about him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, we're going to read some more, but that's an interesting question. Because, see, how Jesus looked at this, because it's blood covenant. <coughs> of what Saul was doing in persecuting these Christians the way Jesus took it because it's a blood covenant relationship and they had become one he said why are you persecuting me? Interesting. And so, so Saul responds and he said well who are you Lord? <laughs> and then the Lord said I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, now this is very interesting. He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's a very interesting response. See, but you got to understand that Saul, even though at this point he's not shaved, he's a He's a man that understands blood covenant. And so, when he has this supernatural encounter with the Lord Jesus, and Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? I'm pretty sure, just by what's taking place here, that he understood what Jesus was saying. Because he understood blood covenant. And then his response in turn is, well, what do you want me to do? Huh? So immediately he knew that there was something that he would need to do. Okay. Now, the Lord then says to him, well, arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. So, Jesus doesn't have a problem with that. He doesn't say, well, that's a dumb question. <laughs> he says, what do you want me to do? He says, well, go rise, go into the city, and it'll be told you what, you what you must do. Well, then we jump to verse 10. Now it says, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, go, arise and go to the street called Straight and acquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. 
And in a vision, he seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Now, he had, he had temporarily lost his eyesight, <laughs> and uh, we could get into a lot of that, but really he'd been, in, he'd been in the presence of God, and there was a reason, I'm sure, behind all that that was taking place. But anyway, then it says, Then Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to the saints in Jerusalem. In other words, he's killing people, killing Christians like me. It says, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call in your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. All right, interesting. See, Paul, being a guy, well, Saul at the time, has a supernatural encounter with Jesus. I mean, and obviously we know that this was his conversion. He's saved. But understanding blood covenant, he knew right away that something was required of him. He said, what do you want me to do? And so Jesus says, well, you know, go here, whatever else, and you'll be told. Well, so then God speaks to Ananias and then tells Ananias that, well, you know, he's a chosen vessel. He's going to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, the children of Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And there's things that he's going to be challenged with in his ministry, you could say, <laughs> in what I got planned for him. But Paul, and, and here's the point I really want you to see, is that from the very beginning, from the very beginning of his salvation, from the very beginning of him entering into this blood covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus, he knew that something was required of him. It wasn't just, well, praise the Lord, I'm saved, isn't it wonderful? No. He knew this was a blood covenant relationship, and in this blood covenant relationship, something's required of me. Amen. And he knew that from the beginning. He says, what do you want me to do? We need to understand that as the church. Amen. That in this blood covenant relationship, we give everything. Something is required of us. It's what do you want us to do? We should have that same response that Paul had. What do you want me to do? Here I am. My life belongs to you. What do you want me to do? Hallelujah. So that's what we give. We give everything. And so much to the point that Jesus said, if someone's not willing to do that, they're not even worthy of me. Now that's pretty strong words, but I didn't make those words up. Amen. Amen. I understand that salvation is a free gift, but it cost <laughs> a lot. Free to us, but it cost a lot. Someone had to purchase it. They gave their life for it, shed their blood, suffered for it. But it is a free gift to us. But we have to realize that in receiving that salvation, something we couldn't provide for ourselves, something we could not purchase for ourselves because we'd all sin and come short. But Jesus came along and he did it for us. But in receiving that salvation, which is free to us, we have to understand that we are now entering into a blood covenant relationship in which now my very life belongs to my covenant partner. And so I'm going to give my very life. Everything. It's what do you want? What do you want me to do, Lord? And so I disregard, lose sight of, forget about my own interests. Now, does that mean then that, well, if I do that, life's going to be so terrible? 
Because, I mean, I got plans, I got goals, I got things I want to do. And so if I just lay my life down, then does that mean that, well, man, I'm just going to go without and life's just going to be the pits? Is that what that means? No, not according to the word of God. It says if we do that, we actually find the higher life. We actually find the life that he's got prepared for us. And so it's not giving up anything. Amen. Amen. Because we, what we get in return far exceeds anything we can give up. But now on the other side of that, there's not only the giving side, but there is the receiving side. And every relationship has to have both. I can come back to the marriage relationship. In that marriage relationship, being a blood covenant relationship, and we've give our, given our lives to one another, see, Again, the relationship is not going to be strong if the partners involved in that relationship don't want to receive anything. And so I could try and provide for my wife and love my wife and do all these things that I'm supposed to be doing for my wife, but if she doesn't receive any of it or doesn't receive even some of it, then it's going to hinder the relationship. So in order for the relationship to be what, it, what God intended for it to be is that there also has to be the receiving side. There can't just be the giving side. There has to be the receiving side as well. You following me? Yeah. And so it's the same with the Lord. We're in this blood covenant relationship. But if it's going to be a successful relationship, not only do I take the position that says, well, Man, everything I have, everything I, I ever will have, who I am, my very life, everything, it all belongs to you, Lord. And so I give you my life. All right. Now, I do that, but in order for that relationship to be successful, I have to be willing to receive as well. Because it works both ways. Because the Lord's in this blood covenant relationship, and he's the one that started it. I didn't even start it. He did and so now when we enter into that relationship, now everything that he has, everything he ever will be, all his wisdom, all his power, everything, all his provision, now belongs to me, and he wants me to receive it. And so, I need to be willing to receive just like I, I have to be in that position that says, I'm willing to give. I'm willing to give my very life, but I also need to be willing to receive all that he's got for me. It's interesting. Read you a couple of verses. These are familiar verses to us, but John 16. John 16, I'll pick it up here in verse 23. Just read a couple of verses. John 16, 23, it says, Jesus said this. He said, in that day, now the day he's referring to is the day of the new covenant after he would go to the cross. He said, in that day, you'll ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name, well, ask. And you will receive, receive so that your joy may be full. Ah. So we have an open invitation to ask. Well, that makes sense. We're in a blood covenant relationship. And in this blood covenant relationship, there's not only the giving side, there's the receiving side. Mm -hmm. And so all that he has, he has, he wants you to receive it. <laughs> and Jesus said, now, when this new covenant is established, which he did do, he says, now you can ask the Father directly and he'll give it to you. So we should never be ashamed to ask. We should never be afraid to ask. <laughs> we should never ask in doubt. Because it's a blood covenant relationship and we've already been given the invitation to ask. Right. 
in order for the relationship to be successful, there has to be the giving, but there also needs to be the receiving. And so we should boldly ask and expect to receive. Look at this. John 15 verse 7. Jesus said this as well. John 15 verse 7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it might be done for you. Amen. No, that's not what it said. It said, it shall be done for you. Ah. Because see, people say, well, you know what? What if I just asked for the wrong thing? Well, what would you do such a dumb thing for? <laughs> people say, well, what if I, would, you know, what if I ask for something that's going to hurt me? Well, again, why would you do such a dumb thing? Yeah. See, people come up with all these crazy things. They'll say, well, you know, if you ask for some financial increase in your life, then people come along and they're trying to reason it out. Well, God knows that if I get this money that I'm going to get caught up in lust and greed. And, you know, and so he's just not going to give it to me. Well, I don't find that anywhere. Huh? Yep. Now, we have the responsibility to make sure we don't get caught up in lust and greed. But there's no place in there where he says, well, I'm not going to give it to you. Yeah. 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 <coughs> he just says this. Now, let's read it. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, well, then you can ask what you will. That's what you desire and it shall be given unto you. Well, because if his words are abiding in you, then you know what is available to you in this relationship. You know who he is. You're abiding in him. You know him. And you know his word. And so you know what he's promised to you and who he is and what he has. And so then you can ask according to his will. You don't have to pray and say, well, Lord, I, I don't know what your will is, and so whatever your will is, that's what I want. No, that's not what he said to do. He said, abide in him and have his words abiding in you, then you can ask whatever you desire, yes. whatever you will, and then it'll be done on you. And so you can know what's available to you in this blood covenant relationship, and so he's given you an open invitation to ask, and then you will, you'll receive it. And that makes for a healthy relationship. Amen. Amen. I mean, think, if we can go back again to the marriage relationship. What if my wife took the position? And something just real simple. I mean, she's sitting in her recliner and relaxing. And then she says, well, honey, you know, I, I know I'm not worthy of this. And I'm, I, I know that this is a big effort for you and I don't even, not too sure you can even do this for me or whatever else, but you know, if you really want to, if it's really your will, could you go to the refrigerator and get me, you know, something to drink? That would be stupid. And I'd respond something like this, what's wrong with you, woman? See, but we're in a relationship and we know each other. We know what we have to bring into the relationship. And we're committed to one another. And so we don't approach things that way. And, um, and it's the same way with the Lord Jesus. We're in a blood covenant relationship. And if we abide in him and his words are abiding in us, then we know what's available to us in this relationship. And we have this open invitation to go ahead and ask. Yes. It belongs to us. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yes. I've joked about it through the years. See, when I, when I raised my children, my children, they assumed that everything that was in my refrigerator belonged to them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And they assume that all my tools yes. belong to them as well. Yes. And the list goes on and on and on. Why? Because they're in the family. Yeah. They didn't have to sit in front of the refrigerator and go, I'm so unworthy. 
to open this refrigerator. I shouldn't open this refrigerator because I just don't deserve any of it. No, they didn't do that. They just went and got in the refrigerator and got what they needed. Well, see, we're in this blood covenant relationship with God, and it's the kind of relationship where, yes, I give, I give my very life, but guess what? He's doing the same thing. Yes. And he gives us an open invitation. You need something? Just go open the refrigerator. Yeah. And he told us how to open it up. Yes. How do we open it up? Ah, let me see. I got to read this verse to you. Here it is right here, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. That's how I opened the refrigerator. Yeah. For surely I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, Be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. And he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So I just live a life of faith. I can ask, believe I receive. I've been given authority. I can, I can command certain things to happen because it belongs to me as a blood covenant partner. I can just open the refrigerator. I can use the tools because they belong to me. Amen. <laughs> There's a toolbox there. Everything that God has, it belongs to me. He's got a toolbox. Whatever I need, I can get it. I need his wisdom. I need his power. I can have it. Amen. I need healing. I can have it. Belongs to me. Because I'm in a blood covenant relationship with him. That's right. Everything that he is, everything he ever will be, now I know he never changes, <laughs> but everything he has, it all belongs to me. And so I can receive it by faith. Have faith in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So there's a giving side, but there's also a receiving side. And we cannot even make one more important than the other. The receiving side in this blood covenant relationship is just as important as the giving side. The relationship won't be successful without it. Amen. And we saw that for those that were <laughs> at the marriage seminar. We saw that when we read there in Ephesians chapter 5 talking about Christ in the church but using the marriage relationship it actually makes the statement that if a husband loves his wife now I'm kind of this is my paraphrased version but he actually is loving himself and he said Christ does the same way with the church because he said nobody, nobody cause, you know, you're, you're, you're now one you're in a blood covenant relationship and so whatever you bring in the relationship is good for the relationship. And so when you're loving your wife, you're loving yourself because it's your one in the relationship. And that's the way it is with the Lord Jesus Christ, see. He wants you to receive everything that he has for you because when you receive it, it makes the relationship good. It makes the relationship healthy. He needs the church. When he is giving to the church, he's giving to him self because he needs the church healthy well prosperous so they can do everything that he's asked them to do yeah. Yeah. hallelujah yeah. so I don't have to wonder well I just don't know does God want me to have this well if you're abiding in him and his words are abiding in you well you know the truth and so just walk in it Amen. say it's mine yeah. yes. hallelujah it belongs to me I receive it Glory to God, hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, I like the giving part, but I like the receiving part too. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You won't find me apologizing for receiving anything. Right. I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for receiving something. Right. Because I'm in a blood covenant relationship. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here, I'm going to close with this. This is Philippians chapter 4. And I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. He says, 
be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let your joy overflow and let gentleness be seen in every relationship for our Lord's near. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day. Offering, now listen to this, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. See, that's how we live. We're just going to offer our faith-filled requests with overflowing gratitude. Why? Because we're in a blood covenant relationship. He's already provided all these things for me. And so, man, I'm just so thankful. I, I just got such great gratitude within my heart, Lord, for doing that. But I'm making my faith-filled request known unto you. <laughs> See? Because I'm going to receive everything you got for me. And then he, then he goes on. He says, tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. Put into practice the example of all that you've heard from me or seen in my life, and the God of peace will be with you in all things. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, we can live our lives that way. We don't have to be worried, anxious. I'm in a blood covenant relationship. Yes. Amen. Amen. Whatever I need. Do I need wisdom? Hey, wisdom belongs to me. I can receive from him. James said if we lacked wisdom, all we had to do was ask and he would give it liberally. Amen. Amen. I've always liked that scripture there in James because he said he'll give it to you without fault finding. He's not going to find fault. You need something? Hey, he'll give it to you liberally. You need wisdom? Just ask. He'll give it to you. He's not going to find fault. Why? Because you're in a blood covenant relationship. It belongs to you. He provided it already. Same thing is true with healing. You need healing, belongs to you already. He's already provided it. Receive it. Hallelujah. Throughout the years, I've been in a lot of meetings with Brother Kenneth E. Hagen. We were playing some of his video there when I walked in today. With Brother, H Brother Hagen, and, and uh, oftentimes he would exhort people. It's yours. Just lift up your hands and receive. Say it's mine. I have it now. He'd, he'd encourage people to do that all the time. Because it belongs to us. Hallelujah. We're in a blood covenant relationship. Man, it's mine. I have it now. I just receive it, Lord. It's mine. If I don't know what to do, man, I can ask for wisdom. Something comes up in my life that has the potential to bring worry, fretting, anxiety. I can just let my request be made known unto him. Because it's, it's mine. I'm in a blood covenant relationship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He owns it all. And he can figure out a way to get it to me. Amen. 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 If he can create the heavens and the earth and everything that's in it, including the gold and the silver, <laughs> he can figure out a way to get it to me. It's just, well, what do I believe? See? But I'm in a blood covenant relationship, and so are you. And it all belongs to us. And so we can just receive. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now that ought to make you get excited. That's why he tells us we ought to rejoice and be glad. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank God that we're in that kind of relationship. Amen. I don't have to talk him into something. 
too many of the prayers from the Christians is trying to talk God into doing something. You don't have to talk him into doing anything. Amen. Amen. If it's you, all you got to do is receive. You don't have to talk him into doing anything. But you do need to know what's available to you. That's why his words need to abide in you. You need to abide in him. But you don't have to talk him into doing anything. Amen. 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 You know, it's interesting, and you know, and I, and I, I always appreciate people's hearts, but I, I think we need to be just a little bit more determined to get things right. I know there's a lot of concern for the country right now, and I, and I, you know, I'm running into this people praying for the country all the time, and that's that's a good thing. I'm glad they are, but see, so much of the time, what I'm hearing is people are trying to talk God into doing something with America. Ah, we don't need to talk God into doing anything with America. We need to exercise our authority. We need to do Mark eleven twenty three. 23. You don't have to convince him to do anything. But see where that mentality comes from too much of the time is that people think, well, God's in control. Well, I've always said through the years, if God was in control, he's doing a lousy job. Amen. But you know, and that sounds good. Well, God's in control. Well, no, he gave authority over unto us. That's why he said, you need to speak to the mountain. See? And Jesus demonstrated that when he was here. He spoke to all kinds of things. The wind, the sea, blind eyes, crippled limbs, even dead bodies. He'd speak. He just exercised his authority. Amen. And so we need to know what belongs to us. Quit trying to talk God into doing something. Just start exercising your authority and then start receiving into your life the things that you need. Right. You don't have to talk God into it. If you're suffering with sickness and disease, you don't have to talk God into healing you. He already provided it for you. That's right. By his stripes you were healed. Yes. It's already a done deal. Yes. Amen. 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 I just need to receive. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. And so I'm going to fill my heart with his word. I'm going to have his words abiding in me yes. so that what? Faith is there. Yes. Yes. And I can receive. Yes. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Yes. Yes. You need finances? You don't need to talk God into giving you some finances. He's already provided it for you. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yep. You just need to receive. Yes. yes amen. So fill your heart with faith. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. And so you can receive what you need. Yes. I just run into that too much. Well, you know, my car is just totally falling apart. And, you know, and I don't know if God wants me to have a new car or not. And then they complain to God. Well, God, can't you see? Can't you see that my car is falling apart? You really need to do something about this. Well, first of all, don't you realize that he already knows that your car's falling apart? Yeah. You don't have to tell him about it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Oh, don't look at me funny, no. <laughs> Just receive. Yes. Well, I mean, I don't know, maybe God doesn't want me to have a new car. Do we need to go over all that again? <laughs> oh, well, you know, money is, you know, the root of all evil. No, it's not. It's the love of it. That's the problem. Hallelujah. Amen. Say, well, if I get too much, I might start loving it. Well, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Give it away. Yes. If you start sensing that you're getting a little bit too attached to these things, then just start giving it away. Amen. 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 And then the only problem with that, you start giving it away, and then just more keeps coming back. So just give some more away then. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. He's a good God, that's for sure. Amen. Amen. 
Yes. We can walk in blessings. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Well, again, Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the people here at this church. And, and Lord, I, I pray that somehow, some way, I was able to speak something into their lives that's going to help them in their walk with you. Lord, it's my desire that all of us continue to grow in you and we understand more and more about the relationship that we have with you, that it's a blood covenant relationship. Hallelujah. And that everything that we are, everything that we have belongs to you and everything that you are and that you have belongs to us. Hallelujah. And we are so grateful for that. We're so thankful that you loved us so much that you did these things for us. That you sent your son and your son purchased that salvation for us. We're so thankful, so grateful, Lord. And we'll continue to grow and learn, continue to walk by faith, and we'll see all that you've got for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You got something? No, I was just going to share something with you. Oh, okay. Um, Dave, that's the guy I'm looking for right there. <laughs> I'm just going to close it with that. You know, yeah. I'm, I found myself, and I, you know, it's, it's interesting sometimes how things go in life, but I found myself in recent years now um, just endeavoring to part more wisdom. You know, because you do actually... If, if you hang around long enough and you're not just a total idiot, I mean, seriously. Yeah. If you actually make some effort to grow and learn and yep. stuff, if you hang around long enough, you gain some wisdom. Yep. No kidding. And so, and you know, not only just in, in the natural, but I mean, from a spiritual side, I've been walking with the Lord for quite a while now and been in ministry quite a while. And so I found more and more that the Lord's just, been endeavoring to lead me to impart wisdom in the people, help people. And, um, and so I just find myself doing that a lot more, it seems like. And, and, so, and never underestimate, see, the ability of the, the Word of God to change your life. I, I love ministry times. I, I love, you know, just the flow of the Holy Spirit and, you know, and people being blessed and helped by the Spirit. I love those times. And God uses me that way. But it seems like in recent times he's had me so much just go in this direction. And so I'm just going to keep following him to see where it goes, what happens. Hallelujah. Because I just, I just want to help you. Amen. Because, I mean, we've we just been, you know, we've been blessed in our lives. And, and um, I just want to see other people walk into what God's got for them to walk, walk in. So... And besides that, God's called me to be a teacher. Amen. And that's what teachers do. Yep. Amen. They teach. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. 